uh, these are my disclosures. So meniscal root tears have been defined as either detachments or avulsions of the posterior root of the meniscus or radial tears occurring within a centimetre of the posterior root attachments. When we consider how our understanding of these lesions has improved over the past 10 or 15 years, it's certainly not been in our understanding of the anatomy. Uh, this is a picture from the original Gray's Anatomy textbook, which is over 100 years old. And then a picture from an anatomical study from La Prade's group. And you can see that these pictures are identical. But where our understanding has improved is our understanding of the biomechanical implications of these injuries. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, we saw the first descriptions of meniscal extrusion and the subsequent uh, understanding of the importance of fixate, fixing the horns in meniscal allograft transplantation. But it was only in the 2000s when our radiological colleagues uh, made the link between root tears, extrusion and degenerative change. Over time, we've come to understand that root tears cause a loss of the ability to convert compressive forces into hoop stresses. Uh, there's a reduction in the contact area and therefore an increase in the contact pressure, and this leads to accelerated chondral degeneration. And this has been described uh, as being the equivalent to a total meniscectomy. Further studies have also highlighted the importance of particularly lateral meniscal root tears in rotational instability of the knee. Uh, root tears lead to increased lateral compartment translation, increased internal rotation, and an increase in the grade of a pivot shift. In terms of diagnosis, medial lateral root tears can be quite different. Uh, medial tears are usually degenerative. Uh, they occur with advancing age, more common in females, uh, in the overweight and with various malalignment. Uh, patients often describe a ping in the knee, uh, which often occurs with a relatively uh, minor injury. And these tears can also occur in a various pattern of multi-ligament knee injury. A classification system has been pr proposed by La Pride's group. The lateral roots, on the other hand, uh, occur uh, more commonly with ACL tears, and they've been described in up to 15% of ACL injuries. They're more common in male rather than female subjects, uh, and they occur more commonly in contact injuries. Uh, we should be suspicious of a, a lateral root tear uh, with a high grade pivot shift, because as we've mentioned, they're associated with increased pivot shift grade, and they can also occur in multi-ligament knee injuries. A classification system here has been proposed, which takes into account injury to the meniscofemoral ligaments, uh, which provided an additional st stabilizing uh, factor for the posterior root. Uh, radiological diagnosis is on MRI scan, uh, but these may be missed uh, commonly, uh, reportedly in up to 30% of cases. Uh, the common sign to look for is the ghost meniscus sign. Uh, and I think now our radiological uh, our colleagues are uh, just uh, finding these with much more regularity. At arthroscopy, our diagnosis is usually relatively straightforward, but they can be missed. Uh, one way they can be missed is when the meniscus appears to be intact and the root is avulsed. Uh, this is more from not being aware of them. And certainly I know that I saw, saw this uh, when I was a junior trainee and the significance was not understood. The significance can also be uh, missed, and particularly with the flap tear on the lateral side, because the lateral meniscus is much more circular and curves back towards you during arthroscopy, uh, these flap type tears are actually the equivalent of the complete radial tear that we see on the medial side, so they can be quite easily missed. In terms of management options for these injuries, we were, there are three options. Uh, firstly, non-operative management. Secondly, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And then lastly, meniscal root repair. If we consider, first of all, on the medial side, uh, non-operative management is associated with poor outcomes. This study from the Mayo Clinic found that 80%, uh, more than 80% had a uh, what was classified as a treatment failure, and over 30% uh, progressed to total knee replacement within five years, which is a pretty catastrophic outcome. Partial meniscectomy uh, for medial meniscal root tears has shown mixed results. Uh, a few studies have suggested include improved PROMs, uh, but overall, the outcomes are no better than non-operative, and particularly with regards to progress to uh, uh, knee replacement. And I think this reflects the severity of the biomechanics of the injury. The third treatment option is uh, meniscal root repair, and uh, this is a, 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 a typical uh, transosseous root repair. So what does the evidence show us for medial meniscal root repair? Well, if we just consider quickly the uh, uh, hierarchy of evidence, 
uh, with medial meniscus root repair, there's a huge or well, quite a lot of uh, bi abundant biomechanical data, uh, but by far the most common uh, published article uh, on medial meniscus root repair is a, a description of a, a technique, either a root repair technique or a, 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 a analysis of uh, part of the uh, technique. Secondly, uh, there are a number of case series and non-randomised comparative studies. There are now too many to list here. Uh, and these in general have showed improved subjective outcomes. Uh, some have shown uh, reduced meniscal extrusion and some have shown slower progress of os towards osteoarthritis. There have now been a number of systematic reviews of these papers. And again, uh, these show improved subjective outcomes. Uh, the impact of root repair on meniscal extrusion and progress of arthritis is unclear, uh, and worse results uh, are seen in established osteoarthritis uh, and various mal malalignment. It should be noted, though, that uh, these systematic reviews do note that uh, the uh, uh, basic, the basics, the papers that these are based on are of generally low to moderate uh, methodological quality. And what we're lacking to, to date is high level, uh, level one or level two evidence. There is now a, a multi-centre uh, study uh, being undertaken, uh, sponsored by Isakos and being led by Jorge Chala from Rush University. Uh, this is a prospective randomised trial of uh, meniscal root repair versus non-operative management. And hopefully this will give us uh, some better quality information on this subject. Uh, in terms of lateral root management, again, the uh, uh, evidence situation is quite similar. Uh, there's certainly a plausible rationale for repair to both improve rotational control and to protect the cartilage. And there's lots of good quality bio biomechanical evidence, uh, but again, there's very little high grade clinical evidence at this stage. So in terms of technique for root repair, uh, for me, this uh, operation begins with a diagnostic arthroscopy, first to confirm that the injury is present and also to, to evaluate the amount of uh, chondral damage in the rest of the knee. Uh, for me, I think if there's already exposed bone in the compartment, uh, it's probably too late. And uh, we also want to make sure that the meniscus is going to be uh, able to hold the stitches. Because of the uh, uh, instruments that we need to get into the medial compartment for this operation, I would tend to use the pie crusting on the medial side to allow adequate access. The next step is to prepare a bed for the repair. Uh, on the medial side, this is done at the uh, side of the radial tear. Uh, on the lateral side, generally, where it's more likely to be an avulsion of the root, this would be done at the root insertion. I use a ring curette to remove some of the cartilage in the area where the repair is going to be performed, uh, and then a mechanical shaver to remove the debris. The next step is to pass sutures into the meniscal root. Uh, there are a number of companies now that have devices for this, and these are usually uh, miniaturized versions of uh, our shoulder instruments. Here we can see the instrument used to pass the suture. Uh, I use a lasso sort of suture tape, which makes it very easy to um, uh, make cinches. Uh, I use a simple luggage tag, tag type cinch uh, with usually two or three of these being sufficient. The next step is to drill a tunnel. I use a short oblique incision, uh, roughly similar to in position to where we'd make an incision for a hamstring harvest. Uh, again, there are mul multiple companies now have their own devices for this. Here we see the guide coming in. And then we see the drill coming up into that pre-prepared bed. Uh, next, we need to shuttle the sutures down through the tunnel. Uh, you can use a suture passer or a number of devices. This is actually a meniscal repair suture, uh, needle that I've just pushed up backwards. And here we see that uh, dunking the meniscal root down into that prepared bed. The final step is then fixation. Uh, I tend to use a, a anchor to bury the suture ends into the pretibial bone, uh, but equally they, these can be tied over a button at the uh, uh, tibial tunnel aperture. So in conclusion, uh, meniscal root lesions have significant biomechanical implications. Uh, medial root lesions tend to be de de degenerative and they do poorly with non-operative treatment and partial meniscectomy. 
uh, lateral root lesions are associated with ACL tears and increase the rotational instability. There's excellent biomechanical evidence to support repair and the available clinical evidence is generally supportive. And we now have a international multi-center randomized trial to give us some more high level evidence. Thank you.